Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much indeed, as always, for being here. Hope all is well with you and yours. It's been a very, very quiet week from an Arsenal perspective, and I was wondering whether or not we would have a podcast this week because, I don't know, do you want to hear the... Arsenal could be signing Gabriel Jesus' conversation yet again. Do we need another William Saliba discussion? No, I don't think we do. So what I decided to do was get a couple of guests, solicit some questions from our Patreon members uh, on our Discord, and they have very, very kindly obliged. Thank you to everybody who sent in uh, your questions, and I think we've got some interesting ones to get our teeth into in this particular conversation, which we're going to get straight into. No messing around today, just wham, bam, thank you, man into the podcast and with me to answer those questions first up is tim stillman hello tim hello there and we've also got phil costa hello phil hi andrew how's it going it's going all right thanks very much um i'm going to start with you tim i think this is quite an interesting one because i heard a very good discussion the other day between elliot and clive i'm not sure if it was on a patreon pod or if it was on the regular pod but it was about um a striker of uh, presence of size um, and Clive was you know just just to sort of give it a very brief explanation he was making the case as to why he thought this would be a good thing for us to have and we have a question um, it comes from uh, Davy M underscore GTR on the discord hi lads with all these links to a tall forward do you expect there to be another striker signing along with Gabriel Jesus and I think this is quite an interesting one because the the idea of like your classic Giroud style centre forward has fallen out of fashion a little bit. I know they exist and what have you, but in Man City and Liverpool, we've seen uh, two teams thrive without that physical number nine, if you like. They've got these very technical, very clever, very mobile, medium sized forwards, and Man City obviously have had loads of them. But this season, this summer, City are bringing in Erling Haaland, who is. Um, uh, he's a big guy and there's a lot of talk today about Darwin Nunes uh, signing for Liverpool another big guy so I mean do you think this is these two teams setting a trend in a way or are, are Liverpool reacting to Man City or is this something that's in their plans and is it maybe something Arsenal should be considering I think um, so I don't think it comes into it with Haaland I think the main thing about Haaland is he's just really good <laughs> and that's kind of that's kind of that with him. But with Liverpool, I do think there's an element of that. And because the other thing Liverpool added, or the other player Liverpool added uh, recently, well, relatively recently, was Diogo Jota. Mm. And one of the things he really added was that aerial presence in, in the box. I mean, they've kind of got that with Mane. Mane's very good in the air, but but Jota scored a ton of headers. And when you've got fullbacks like Robertson and Alexander-Arnold, who are really good crossers, it makes sense, you know, Roberto Firmino, for all his qualities, is not the guy who's going to, you know, going to take advantage of those crosses. So I do think there has been a slight switch in terms of Liverpool wanting that a little bit. It, from an Arsenal perspective, I think this is a fascinating question because it just goes into that um, that question. Like, it looks like that maybe next season our strikers will be Gabriel Jesus and Eddie Nketiah. It looks like that's what they're shooting for anyway. Mm. And so you really don't get that from either of them. So it plays into this question, should you say, no, no, we just want plan A and we want to perfect plan A, particularly at this point of our trajectory, plan A, plan A, plan A at all times, or... Do you want to have that other option, but perhaps make plan A take a little bit longer? Because when, again, when you look at Liverpool, Liverpool didn't always do that. In fact, one of the first players that uh, Klopp sold was Benteke. He made it very clear, I do not want this type of striker. That's mm. not the type of football I'm, I'm shooting for here. But now, now maybe they're a bit more comfortable in their own skin. They're a bit more adaptable. They're a bit more flexible. He's adding that option. And so maybe there's an element of that for Arsenal. What's interesting for me is when I think of the big striker, I don't think of crosses into the box. Um, although, if you, again, if you've got Kieran Tierney, I suppose if you've got Cedric, you know, fairly decent crosses of the ball, albeit Cedric does it maybe a little bit too often, then it would make sense to have that. But again, Gabriel Jesus, actually very, very good attacking crosses, scores lots of headers, 
because you're very good at finding space. Mm. I think of it more in the defensive aspect. So at the Newcastle game, um, you know, I was I was up behind the goal. You're up in the gods at Newcastle. It's not a great seat, but sometimes it shows you things and, and you know, what everyone saw. But what you really, really saw if you're up there in the away end is the extent to which we were getting penned in. And it's at that point I thought, you know, oh, it'd be nice to have like a Calvert-Lewin or an Abraham, not to attack crosses in the box, but just to get us out of here. Yeah. Um, you know, but then again is the question, well, actually, we don't want that option. What we want to do is to be better at playing around the press because Man City don't use that option. They don't go over the top. They just get better at passing. They're just brilliant at passing through. So it, it's a real like, it's a real philosophical squad building question about what you want. But, you know, we sat together right at the Everton game and I kind of said, I think in an ideal world, money, no object, I'd love to have like Gabriel Jesus, number one, and then have Calvert-Lewin as the kind of Giroud, you know, as the kind of we're getting hemmed in here. And and, and I think about him in the centre circle rather than the penalty area. So that it could be that this is a bit of a trend. I do think that um, with the rise of pressing, you'll see the target man come back um, quite a bit. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see someone like Verkhorst, for example, leave Burnley and come back into the Premier League. I do think that player will be more attractive, but I'm very fascinated to see what Liverpool and Man City do with it, certainly. Phil, any thoughts on this one? Because we have obviously been linked in the last week or so with a, a tall striker from Italy, uh, Gianluca Scamacca, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apologies to any Italians uh, listening, but he's a big guy as well. He's like six foot four, six foot five. Um, he would certainly give us something different. But I, maybe we, maybe we, um, I don't know. Do we put too much in the idea that we don't have enough variety in our attack? Before, as Tim says, we we hone and absolutely nail down what it is we want to do from an attacking perspective. Uh, you know, personally, I wouldn't be at all against the idea of having somebody at the club who uh, a could be like a good backup. He can play some Europa League games, but also give you the ability to change a game. Um, by playing in a slightly different way. And as we think about how does Mikel Arteta solve the problem of overturning deficits in games, which was a big Achilles heel last season, something like that must be tempting when you're squad building. Yeah, totally. I mean, that that was kind of how, how I see it. I don't see it really as um, asking for the easy way out if you're not, you know, perfecting plan A or, or whatever it is. I just think particularly last season, there were too many games where the opposition, maybe back four, but the back two in particular, the two centre-halves were just having a holiday against Arsenal. Um, and that's because, well, we know the the physical limitations of, of Alex Lacazette. Um, and that's why it was so st- stark when Eddie came into the side at the end of the season because he was actually running. Mm you know, and and giving defenders a bit of a fight. And I think the interesting thing is with Nunez um, is that he can run the channels quite capably. He's big, strong, upright runner. And, you know, I know Arsenal have been linked to Skamaka, but he's not really the typical target man. He's a kind of very technically competent, you know, he likes the battle. But when I, when I see someone like Calvert-Lewin, I see someone kind of tailor-made for the Premier League where he can still affect games without without doing much. And that's just through sheer presence. And I think Arsenal, you know, I'm 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 perfectly happy with Gabriel Jesus coming in or if, if he's our primary target, if we'd like to try that kind of Manchester City, everybody rotating, someone going left, someone going right, someone filling into the middle. I've I've got no issue with that. But I just feel like to give the opposition something more to worry about. Because let's say we do have Gabriel Jesus up front and he has a bad game and he's marked out of the game. Then will Eddie and Ketia coming on really change that? Um, mm. You know, if the if the defenders are quite comfortable battling that kind of smaller um, penalty box presence. I don't know. I for For too long, I felt like we've... We've needed someone to just run the channels, to battle people, to put your elbows up, to, you know, to really give you 
something different and that maybe vacates space for Bakayo Saka or Gabriel Martinelli or Smith Rowe out wide. It just gives you something else. It gives you another option. And mm. I know very loosely we've been linked to a couple of others like Victor Osimhen. I mean, if you know, it's a shame that deal was, would cost you know mad sums because I think he's an excellent striker. Um, and it's quite ironic because we basically had him in our hands after the the Under-17 World Cup. When was it? A few years ago. And we ended up signing Kalechi Nakwali. Um, and that really didn't go well. Um, but I think someone like that, who's a bit of a bully, um, it could really do this side wonders because everyone points at Olivier Giroud's record um, after he left Arsenal. But how many times was he actually starting the games? Um, it was mostly him coming on in the last half hour, last 25 minutes, and just really making himself a presence. And I think having somebody of that ilk, I don't know who it's going to be, whether it's Skamaka, Calvert-Lewin, um, you know, the, the Nunez ship has obviously sailed now with him going to Liverpool, most likely. But for me, I'm all in on on the, the double striking edition, the double forward edition. Um, and I think Gabriel Jesus can capably play, play wide um, to kind of vacate the space that's going to be left by, let's be honest, Nicola Pepe. So um, that's how I how I kind of see things. All right. Well, let me just uh, follow up with a question to you. I'll give this one to you first, Phil. Um, Mark, uh, Mark Lusky, Mark Lucy, I think how it is. I ca can't really see because I haven't got my glasses on. I haven't got the text big enough. Sorry about that, Mark. Anyway, he says, we all know Arsenal need a number nine and a number eight. And there have been names. But what comes next in terms of priority for you personally? Ooh. Um, so number nine, number eight, I would, I would probably go for a, a wide forward. Um, I think some kind of, um, yeah, I, I mean, it depends on whether you consider Gabriel Jesus as the number nine, but let's say he, the Mark was considering a more, you know, typical number nine. I think a wide forward of, of some kind, because, as I said, Nicola Pepe, his future is, is not at Arsenal. Um, and I think we just need a, maybe a little something extra um, in the wide areas because I think people forget how young we are <laughs> in those positions. Um, and it's not a bad thing. Actually, they were probably our best performers last year, the likes of Bukayo Saka, Gabriel Martinelli, Emil Smithrow. I mean, they were our top scorers. They were kind of what we were pinning our top four hopes on last season and ultimately we just fell short. But I think just some just some help in the wide areas, maybe someone coming from the left um, or, you know, obviously the link's been Serge Gnabry, um, but, you know, that's, <laughs> I'm, you know, uh, slightly more realistic with that name. But, um, you know, we've been linked to Cody Gakpo in, in the past and I just think maybe a tall-ish wide forwards who can kind of play in that Hyun Min Song kind of style where they start off wide but come in. Um, yeah, I think I would go with a wide forward because I don't see many other gaps. I mean, obviously there's the issue of Nuno Tavares. Is Are we going to loan him out? But for me personally, I wouldn't loan him out until the Europa League group stages are done. I think there's valuable minutes uh, for him in that competition and also even in the Premier League you know if we're playing a, a newly promoted side at home we don't need to risk Kieran Tierney every week I mean these are the minutes where you can really judge and assess how a player's come on maybe at right back again but the club seem well the noises are that the club seem happy with Cedric as the understudy so yeah mm. uh, I think aside from number eight and and Number nine, I'd, I would say maybe a wide forward either from the right or the left who can, you know, score goals, who can really help us get to that, not even Liverpool and City levels of goal scoring, but just give us a little bit extra, maybe yeah. five or ten more a season because that would make a massive difference. I mean, we saw with Spurs how much um, essentially two players carried them over the line. So just yeah. to give us that little bit extra would be wonderful for me. Tim, anything different? Because I was going to say, like, a, you know, a right-sided 
attacking player who could take some of the burden off Bakayo Saka. And I know that's probably not the way you should think about squad building, but I also think, and we'll probably touch on this with another question later, you have to think about squad preservation a little bit as well. And Bakayo Saka played a lot last season. He played um, an international tournament. Um and he doesn't really have or didn't have last season uh, the kind of backup that you could use to give him a rest for a game or two or even just sort of start him on the bench and bring somebody on. I know we've been linked to the the Brazilian uh, Marquinhos. Um, we don't quite know how complicated that situation is given the fact that he seemed to have signed a pre-contract with Wolves. It could be nothing. It could be tricky. We don't quite know. And we don't also know how ready that player is to play in the Premier League, which I think is where we have to kind of set the bar for the players that we're bringing in. They need to be pretty much Premier League ready. So I was thinking a right-sided attacker would be next for me. Um, have you any different thoughts on that? I could see you nodding away when, when Phil was talking there, so you're probably on more or less the same page, but rack your brains. A hundred percent I am. I tried to do earlier this week as a bit of a thought experiment. Obviously, it's very early in the summer. I thought, what's our Europa League 11 going to be? And I found I could I could move quite quickly through defence and, mid, and even midfield. And then when I got to the forward positions, it's like in Ketia. And then it's like, all right, so on the left, we've got Smith Rowe and Martinelli on the left at the moment. I think that's good. Like that. Mm. Obviously, in Ketia, if he signs his new contract, he's going to be the backup striker. Um, fair enough. He'll be the Europa League striker, most likely. But then it's on the the, the two positions I fell short on were, yep, the right. Um, and I do think we need one more player in there so that we have two players for each position. Again, appreciate perfectly that Gabriel Jesus can play on the right and has done very well for Brazil in the past. But the other one is the number 10, because nominally at the moment, Smith Rowe is the kind of backup for the number 10, but mm. he's very different to Erdegaard. And, and also I think he's doing something, I, I just prefer him wide left. That's that's where I see him. I think that's his position and maybe he'll turn into a left eight. I think he'll be on the exterior of the team. I don't see him as an interior player, uh, not yet anyway. Um and so it's it's one of those, but basically I think we're light one attacker. Whether it's a right-sided player, as you say, to because we'll probably lose Pepe, Reese Nelson's probably not going to stay, so we're probably light there, or a number ten. I I don't know, and and perhaps Smith Rowe can play in all of those roles. I just think we need one more player there, basically. Um, particularly with the Europa League in mind. that That's where I'd go next. Right, yeah. So we're all looking for another attacking player. So we want a couple of strikers. We want a winger. We want to load up up top, I think. Um, even though I think you could probably make a case for somebody who could slot in uh, and do the Odegaard job as well. But how difficult it is to maintain the balance of your squad in that sense, I, I don't yeah. quite know. And, and I was going to say, we've got to look at the reality, right? That we lost a Bamiyang in January, we're losing Lacazette, and we're probably going to get rid of Pepe. Mm. That's essential. That's like £180 million worth of attacker who's not going to be with us next season. Now, some of that has already been replaced by academy players, but, and, and you know, we think we'll get the big striker signing, but yeah, it still feels one light to me. Um, Tim, I'll stick with you. Rudy Roods says... Do you think that the change to the five sub rule will impact Arteta and Edu's transfer window? Case being having almost a secondary squad of quality players in games to bring on rather than rotational players could make the difference. I also imagine other teams will be planning accordingly. And it is something I think they probably have to think about is like, okay, we can use five subs. We've been down this road. They've had some experience of it during the, the lockdown period, of course. Other leagues had it last season as well. But when they think about how they build their squad, there is the potential to to really have a big impact on games, not just with three subs, but with um, with five. And again, maybe it comes back to that first question, that if you can use those extra subs, even if you get hamstrung by, you know, an injury in the first half or whatever it might be, an enforced substitution of, of some description, you still have the ability to, like, just throw on all the forwards in the classic Arsene Wenger style. Yeah, 100%. I was thinking that when, when you guys were talking about, like, the big striker, that exactly the five sub rule, I, th I think that that's going to be... 
not necessarily a game changer. I might not go that far, but it's it's well, yeah, maybe it is a game changer mm. um, because it literally changes the game. You can change half of your outfield uh, players now, and that's that's massive. That is a really big change that involves the coaches more and makes the games potentially more tactical. And and I think that that definitely does change things a little bit. Um, forgive me for the motorbike that's that's just, fine. Like, Don't worry, <laughs> going past. <laughs> But, but I think for us, there's a couple of things there. It probably goes hand in hand with the fact that we need a squad for the Europa League anyway. But also what it does is it means there's minutes to go around. And so someone like Saliba, for example, you can say, look, you're probably not in the first choice back four, but maybe your first choice back up for the right and left centre back. And maybe when Tomiyasu's not available, Ben White shifts across and you're in there and we've got five subs. And we got the Europa League. Like for a lot of these players, and and particularly because I think once we do the number eight and the number nine, really what we're talking about is thickening thickening out the squad mm. again. And if you're trying to attract players, and they kind of know they're going to be squad players, you can say to them, "Yeah, all right, you might or you might start off that way." But there are plenty of minutes we can give you in the Europa League and with the five sub rule. I think it potentially helps us in the market, particularly trying to buy that level of player um, so that we're not buying like Cedrics who are or at the end of their career. Like if you want yeah. more Lacongas, more Tavareses, you know, the, the kind of the up and coming players to be squad players, it's much easier, particularly this season than last season where perhaps some of those players stagnated because they didn't play and then we needed them. Like now we mm. can... We can make that less of an issue next season, I think. Yeah, Phil, what, what do you reckon on this five subs thing and, and how it might, uh, A, impact the summer and also, B, when you're a manager thinking about how you use a bigger squad and a deeper squad, it's five subs from nine that are going to be uh, named in, in every game. I mean, do you think or do you envisage any particular um, tactical tweaks that we might see or is it just going to be a case that, you know, a lot of people will say it benefits the big teams because they can stockpile a lot of good players. And look, there's some truth to that as well. But I think we've also seen at Premier League level that, you know, a, a so-called smaller team that's well-organized and disciplined can implement a game plan which makes life very difficult and can frustrate those big teams and if you get to 60 minutes and these guys have been defending for their lives and it's tough work and it's hard to concentrate and it's physically draining the ability to maybe change two or three or four of those pieces to give yourselves fresh legs to keep that game plan going could be really beneficial to some small teams as well yeah i mean actually i'm going to be watching this this topic with interest because I feel one of my not gripes, but something I've noticed with Mikel Arteta is he, how he uses his squad. Um, and I feel like with him, there's like either you're completely in favor, you're completely out of favor, but I, I never see anybody in the middle. Um, and for me, that kind of thinking has to change next year. Um, or next season, sorry, because as Tim alluded to, we're going to have more opportunities in Europe. Um, there's going to we're going to need some some extra legs in in the league to try and you know whether we're defending a lead, whether mm. we're chasing um, a result, we're going to need our squad. And I felt like too many times this year, Pepe was like completely in the cold, or mm. Sambi was completely in the cold, or Nuno Tavares was completely in the cold or, you know, even, even in Ketia for a while was just like not even being used at all. And I think, you know, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes or in training or whether they've had an argument or whatever, but I just felt that we were so reliant on our first 11 or 12 mm. that when one or two pieces of the jigsaw came out, it was just like, no, there was no way to to replace them, mm. and particularly with Arteta, we our record coming from behind was so bad. Um, what was it? I think we lost ten out of eleven. Um, wasn't it the the game against Wolves that that was the only one mm. managed to turn around? Um, and coincidentally, his substitutes ended up making the difference in that game. Um, 
And I, I didn't see that nearly enough last year. I felt like we were just chasing games, but it would be the same kind of thing happening, the same tactics. It wasn't working for Odegaard, so we'd give it to Saka and then he'd get crowded out. And I just felt like Arteta didn't really have it in him to turn games around from the bench. And whether that was a quality issue, probably. Um, there was definitely an air of, of that being an issue. Um, but I think think next season Arteta really has to utilize his bench because there were too many games this year where we were just kind of pushing and pressing with the same ideas with no plan B and again that kind of hints back to what we were saying about the big striker the big number nine um, where you know we'd have like one shot on target in the last half an hour or you know and it's just we need more we need more in those kind of situations and of course there's the argument, oh, the big teams can bring on, you know, if Bernardo Silva's playing, oh, what's that? You can take him off and bring on Kevin De Bruyne. You know, obviously there's mm. there's that example, but I think that's only really applicable to a select few, um, i.e. Liverpool or Man City. Um, but like you said, when, when teams are coming to frustrate Arsenal with a low block um, and let's say you know, their right wing back is knackered and they can just bring someone else on to run up and down the touchline. I think it's a huge advantage. So mm. obviously the the big teams do have an advantage, but I certainly think it levels out the playing field. But from from the takeaways that I take here, um, it's about how Mikel Arteta uses his squad, um, you know, how much he trusts the, the so-called squad players and also his ability to change things from the bench because I felt particularly this season, it was a big flaw. Um, and I never really trusted the guys coming on or I never really trusted him to do much in the last 20 minutes when we were chasing games. I don't know how you guys, if you guys thought differently or the same or, but that was something I'd, I'd noticed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a quality and depth issue, which hopefully we are going to address. And a trust issue as well. I think the, like I think your point about... His trust in certain players is is obvious, and his lack of trust in other players is also quite obvious at times. Um, although I will say, you know, maybe Nuno Tavares is the guy who was out and then back in because it looked like he wasn't um, on the page and then came back in. Whether that was necessity or or, or something else, we'll have to wait and see. Tim, we've got a few about um, international football. Um, one from Fleds who says, now that the UEFA Nations League has been around for a while, what are your thoughts on it? It seems like there are more international matches of value, but I struggle to get into them and there are still uh, there still seem to be plenty of pointless friendlies has the nations league made things better or worse so personally uh, this isn't a good time to say this because there are nations league games happening at the moment and it's <laughs> preposterous that these guys are still playing football when the premier league season starts on like august the 6th and they still haven't finished and like i'm looking at some of these nations league games at the moment and i know why they're happening because of covid backlogs and everything but it's like god this is ridiculous is there one person in the world who would care if these games weren't happening at the moment <laughs> and those guys were on the beach but generally i think the nations league has been a really good thing First, I mean, I haven't been hugely into it, but I think the couple of things it's done, it's just created more meaningful games. But I think the biggest thing it's done is it's it's pitted UEFA teams against teams of the same level. And I think you can already see how that is benefiting some of the middle tier and some of the lower tier nations in UEFA, that they're playing each other. And they've actually got something fairly meaningful to play for with all the kind of promotion and relegation. And it's the same for the bigger teams as mm. well. Like they cut, well, I mean, they can if they want, but it actually has an impact on your ranking and things and things like that that are important. And the big teams, they can't coast. And you get like England v Germany recently. It didn't feel meaningful, but it kind of was. Like neither of those teams want to lose that game because neither of them wants to slip into like the second ranking. So I, I do think it's been a good thing. I think the other thing is as well, quite a lot of UEFA international football just doesn't feel as meaningful as it does in other parts of the world. I think like covering Brazil as I did for, for a few years, like gave me that view into Conmebol. 
and like international football because I, I used to be really cynical cynical about him it's like oh, you know it should barely exist anymore but then when you think of like um you know the example I'd always use is I used to watch Chile and how much Alexis Sanchez and Arturo Vidal and, and Co oh. love playing for Chile and how much like Chilean fans deserve to see those players that they've produced, but they don't get to see because they come over to Europe. So, you know, it, it gave me like a more rounded appreciation of the international game. And and I think UEFA, you know, particularly speaking as an English person that supports an English team in the Premier League, like watching England other than in the World Cup and in the Euros doesn't hold a great deal of appeal to me. Um, personally, I'm only semi-interested in them, but I'm saying that from a position of, from a p- football perspective, privilege because you know one of the biggest, certainly the richest league in the world, is on my doorstep. Yeah, and my team is on my doorstep, and I get to you know so like watching England on Channel Four. You know nothing mm. against Channel Four. I like Channel Four. You know, but it's just like yeah, okay. Like I'm quite spoiled from a football perspective. So watching England, and and I think a lot, not all, but a lot of you know, UEFA nations have that. But then I look at like someone like Croatia, and again, Croatia produce brilliant world-class players, but they don't get to see them in their own league because they all go to Europe. And so mm. I, I think also because UEFA is so big and it just has so many countries, like I, I think something like the Nations League was was necessary to either that or like a regionalization. I, I think was needed with UEFA. So yeah. I think it's been a success. All right, that's interesting because I really haven't paid a great deal of attention to it. Um, you know, my my interest in uh, international football is really only around the big tournaments. I don't sort of care one way or the other. If Ireland qualify, great. If they don't qualify, eh, you know, it's not really uh, something that gets me down. But that idea that there's an equalization when you're playing teams, like nobody needs to see Germany against Luxembourg or San Marino uh, because we all know what happens in that. Phil, any quick thoughts on the uh, Nations League? I mean, I think Tim's point about the fact that these guys, it's June the 9th as we're recording this and they, they haven't got their holidays yet. And we're go- we're going into uh, an early starting Premier League season, and then a uh, you know a weird season with the World Cup. And I've got a question for you about that, so don't go too far ahead. But any quick thoughts on Nations League? Do you ever watch like cooking shows or YouTube videos about cooking when they like cook pieces of meat for ten hours or twelve hours and they just fall off the bone? Yeah, that's what I feel like. Bukayo Saka's hamstring is going to be by <laughs> by the time we get to August. It, like all the tendons are just going to slide off because, <laughs> like I was, I was, I wasn't keeping a, a too much of a close eye on on the England Germany game, but I had like you know the odd look, and it was just why why are we doing this now? You know, mm. it was like, and it wasn't even you know neither manager rotated because as as Tim mentioned, they don't want to lose the game. But it was they kind of looked lethargic and and slow and they weren't snapping into jewels and you could see that they were just playing like a tempo below mm. what they're used to and I just think it's ridiculous really I mean as in general um, I agree I think pitting countries against each other of a more equal standing and quality has made for much more interesting. Um, football in general. I think San Marino should be playing Estonia and Spain should be playing France. Like for me, that's clear because otherwise you just end up with boring 11 nil games that no one cares about. Um, So from that kind of viewpoint, I completely agree with both of you. And I Mm. think it's only been good, but yeah, I just think these these players need a break because the last two years have been so intense with congested fixture scheduling and COVID... You know, I think what's gone on radar is a lot of players are suffering with long COVID, but they just don't mention it. Um, But in the last year or so, we've seen Paul Pogba struggle. We've seen Kai Havertz struggle. We've seen Alfonso Davies out with, you know, myocarditis. And we've seen, Mm. it takes a while for these players to, to come back like it would any of us if we got unlucky with long COVID. And I just think we're not looking out for them at all. But yeah, I mean, they're going to, they're going to want to play regardless, but sure. I think that the scheduling is doing them no favours. Well, famously, as we know, the authorities uh, in football, their first priority is player welfare at all times. Oh, yeah. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> totally, totally. I'm yeah. sure they'll get on this. Uh, let me ask you this one then, uh, Phil. Optimistic Gunner says, 
Do you think the post-World Cup season is going to be a bit of a crapshoot as to who and who isn't fully fit? And vis-a-vis, how important is the pre-World Cup points tally going to be? Oh, yeah, very. Um, I think it's it's imperative that Arsenal start well this, this season. I think particularly because we'll have Europa League games before before the World Cup. I mean, they're not so demanding and I think we'll obviously rotate, but we don't want to be in a position where we're needing to make up ground already, um, which has been the case on a couple of occasions. I mean, even last year we were <laughs> bottom of the league after three games. So mm. um, I, I, I think it's imperative that we start well. Um, and it's also going to be interesting because I, I'd read something about the Premier League asking or, or, or the FA asking the Premier League not to have big sides yeah. facing off against each other. Um, and I'm, I wasn't really sure. I, I mean, I, I skimmed over the article. But is that being done from more of like a player preservation angle so that they don't exert overexert themselves or... I just found that really strange because I'd never heard of that before. It feels very match fixy to me, but um, you know, who am I to, to judge the honest people at the Premier League? So, um, but yeah, I think having a, a big start, a good start is very important. And that doesn't just mean from the first game of the season. It means having people back, rested, integrated. That means transfers coming in as early as possible to get acclimatized. That means, you know, nailing your systems and your tactics. It doesn't just mean, oh, it's the first game of the season we need to win. I think it means as soon as those boys get back from preseason, um, getting the, the transfers in as soon as possible, getting everybody on the same page, um, fitness needs to be up there as soon as we can get it there. Obviously, there's going to be some early season rustiness and that's normal. But last season... Obviously, Arsenal were unlucky with a with a few COVID cases. We had a very unforgiving fixture list. Um, but also going into the season, I didn't think we were totally prepared. Um, I think some transfers, i.e. Tommy Asu, went through quite late. Ramsdale went through quite late. Ben White was a late returnee from the Euros. Um, and I think there's things we can do to maybe offset that this season um, after the World Cup, which is a completely alien situation mm for everybody sure. um, and I hope we never have to deal with it again but yeah I think they should be putting plans in place to try and minimise any issues coming back from that tournament um, Tim I'll let you just ch- uh, chip in on that um, but I'll just throw this one at you as well from ATX Burke Camp Lover 69 69 420 <laughs> uh, there's some numbers all right um he says greetings from texas is there an optimal number of players from your squad to send to a world cup too many and you suffer burnout too few and your players probably aren't very good any thoughts appreciated so you could uh, have a have a go at that one but also just sort of general thoughts on what that mid-season world cup is going to mean not just for arsenal but i think for the premier league and the physical demands that are going to be placed on some of the players while some players will have this this mid-season break, which I guess they'll try and organize some friendlies or or what have you, but it's going to be a difficult balancing act dealing with the players who are suffering from World Cup fatigue, if you want to call it that, and ensuring that those who aren't going are match sharp or match fit or, you know, on their toes, if you like. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing to consider as well is that it's going to be played in a completely different climate. Um, so you're going to go from like English winter to Qatar and mm. play a game like a, a week later and, and adjust to that. And that's that's going to take its toll. I, I was, I'm was i glad you lobbed that question in because I was thinking about this the other day and I was looking at, because Arsenal have got quite a lot of players potentially going to the World Cup. But when I looked at it, a lot of them either play for countries that aren't going to go very deep, I don't think, or they play for countries that might go deeper but don't necessarily start. So like, Ben White, for example, I mean, he's probably still borderline whether he'll get in the England squad. If he does, he probably won't play. And and that doesn't mean there's no physical toll. He's obviously still over there. He's still mm. training. He's still, you know, changing his mental focus and things like that. But 
and and I haven't compared it to like what I don't know like I, I think we'll be competing for the top four with Spurs again for example I haven't entirely compared it to what Spurs what might happen to Spurs but someone like Harry Kane for example as far as England go if fit he'll play every single minute of every game um, unfortunately Saka will probably come close to that as well but I was looking through yeah. it and I was just thinking yeah a lot of these players might be home after the group stage or the round of 16 or something like that or they'll they'll be on the bench for most of the tournament so from that perspective I do think there's maybe some green shoots for Arsenal and something they can work with particularly if they start to get players back from the World Cup before some of their rivals, you mm. know, who are going out in group stages or whatever. Uh, and obviously they'll have to have contingency planning for that because at the moment what will happen, players will come back at random and they have no idea when they're going to come back. So that's very difficult for the strength and conditioning staff because, you know, let's say, I don't know, Martin Odegaard comes back. Have Norway qualified? No, I don't think so. No. All right. Well, there's another player who's yeah. who's, who's not playing. So... You know, but like a player like have Egypt qualified? I really should look at who's qualified for the World <laughs> Cup. But like, let's say El Neni comes back after the group stage. Like, if you're a strength and conditioning coach, like you've got to pretty much instantly give these guys a plan and just be like, right, okay, you're back. Oh shit, here's a plan for you because we don't have a game for another three weeks, and we're actually we're playing a friendly over here. So there's mm. going to have to be so much flex, but. I don't think it should be too bad for Arsenal when you consider that like everyone's going to suffer through this. Um, but the only other thing I'd say, which is not an Arsenal focus on the question, I think it's going to make for an awful World Cup. Um, I do really you? do. Like no preparation. You know, the league finishes and you play your first World Cup game a week later with no friendlies. There'll be no none of that build up that you get in the summer, like with a big month build up. I think it's going to be really poorly received because it's going to feel like people have had their season taken away. Like the Premier League, Europe, all gets in the swing and then bang, it's stopped for a month and everyone's going to go, what the fuck? Yeah. And now I'm watching like Belgium, um, you know, play at five miles an hour in 35 degree heat in a group stage World Cup game. I think it's going to take people a long time to get into. Do you, um, do, do you not yeah, think there I might think be a bit of... A poor tournament. Do you not think there might be a bit of chaos because of that, like maybe the preparation isn't as good as it should be or would be normally under ideal circumstances. They, you know, they have their summer training camps and everything else, but it might, it might just throw up surprises in terms of performances and players or teams that might do, do things we don't necessarily expect. I mean, I completely agree with you. I think the, I think the sudden halt to the season is going to be very difficult to, um, to get our heads around. Uh, and I think that's something we have to acknowledge that in Europe, you know, this is something that is new to us. It's not necessarily new for other countries. They have to deal with that all the time. But um, I, I just wonder if it might make things a little bit crazy. It might be poor, but it might also be entertaining because of that. Yeah, and, and certainly if I were um, perhaps an, an unfancied country who's more used to that type of climate, you know, I'd be thinking, hmm, first get like, I maybe in the first games or the second round of games, we see some surprise results. So, mm. yeah, like maybe some of those South American countries who were, you know, like uh, not, not like your kind of Brazil, Colombia, uh, sorry, Brazil, Argentina, but, you know, who are maybe more used to that type of climate, um, you know, if I were one of those, I'd be thinking, okay, we can go for these in the first game, uh, for example. So I, I think you might get some. I, I don't think we'll get a surprise winner or anything like that. I do think as the tournament goes on, you know, the wheat will sort from the chaff. But yeah, I could see some surprise results, certainly in the first round of games. Mm. All right, we had a couple of questions on the captaincy. Phil, I'll give these uh, to you. Everybody was Kung Fu Fight and says, what do you think about Saka as a potential captain? English, superstar in the making, will be playing starting for the English national team for the foreseeable future. Crazy competitive, but calm, cool, and collected. And he talks about the penalty he took against uh, Chelsea. He says, uh, I just feel he will be brilliant at it. Any thoughts on that? An Arsenal fan nation uh says uh goodly summer gentlemen what do you think about paul merson calling for arsenal to give the captaincy to ben white i think he leads with the way he plays but i don't think he should be the man to take the armband so thoughts on those two and if you've got a, a suggestion yourself feel free 
Yeah, I, I, honestly, I haven't thought about this in too much depth because I don't really care um, about the captaincy in general. I think, you know, you don't need to wear an armband to lead. Um, I think that's quite a, an outdated kind of view on the on the captaincy. But in terms of Bukayo Saka, uh, um, do we have that leadership group under Arteta? Like the, I think so, yeah, the, yeah. I think he'll be part of the group. Um, he should be part of the group, but I don't see him with the armband. I kind of think he's got enough pressure on his shoulders already and we don't need to add something else uh, onto him because I'm kind of just happy leaving him to do what he's doing. He kind of plays with this verve and energy and carefree spirit that, you know, get your head down, try and take on your full back and go again. I kind of like that about him. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I would give it to Saka. I think he's doing perfectly well um, in the in the role he's given now. I think he's more of a, um, a, a reference point, uh, a technical reference point. But I... I you know, it's obvious that when we we have our full 11 out there, for example, let's say I think a lot of our football goes down the right for that very reason. I think he's, um, you know, an, an on-pitch leader, but I don't see him mm. as sort of captain material. Ben White is someone I'd see a lot more with the armband. I think he's quite calm. I think he radiates calm, but I also like that he's got a little bit of, something in him you know we, we've seen him you know there was a an argument or a, you know I think the game we had away at Norwich I think he was he spent half of it kicking Brandon Williams so <laughs> and there was a few other examples you know a couple of trips on the halfway line is like whoa, whoa, whoa I didn't do anything but you know you clearly see him stick the leg out I think it was on Raul Jimenez and you know um, him playing against Newcastle as basically a one-man defense with with his knees hanging off basically in that disappointing game that we lost. So I think he's got a little bit of a little bit of steel to the to the ice cool nature that we that we see on the pitch. Um, my two cents is that it will go it will go to Martin Odegaard. Um, I just think, in a way, that Mikel Arteta was the on-pitch tactical and technical leader for, for Arsene Wenger. I think that role has been assumed by Martin Odegaard. Um, I think he's the trigger for the pressing. I think he's the technical security when we need it. I think he's the the key to the seemingly unpickable lock when we need it. And I just think in general, he's a very smart guy who sees football um, in a very intelligent way. I think he's got a high IQ. I think he's grown in stature with the team. I think last season he kind of made this team completely his own. Um, and if not for the whole season, for large spells. And I just see him, you know, when we're having a drinks break or someone's down on the floor, who is Arteta giving instruction to or chatting with? And often it's it's Odegaard. So I just see him as kind of the, the on-pitch presence that, you know, Mikel Arteta, what he can't get across to the players from the touchline, I think those ideas radiate through Martin Hedegaard. Mm. And that's why I think um, he'll be the one to take the armband, especially because Arteta's spoken or talked him up about his leadership and how Hedegaard has, has often said in interviews, I'm, I'm feeling more responsible. I think I've matured as a player now. I think it's kind of just the perfect storm for, for that situation to happen. Tim, I mean, I, I tend to agree a lot there with what Phil has said, uh, particularly about Odegaard and what Arteta sees in Odegaard that, you know, maybe reflects back um, in terms of who he was as a player. But when we did have Kieran Tierney in the team before he picked up that injury towards the end of the season, uh, it was Tierney who had the armband when Lacazette didn't. I mean, do you think there's scope for, and I know you're um, a bit like Phil in terms of how you view the captaincy. I think if you've got, if you've got a Tony Adams and you, you, you can wring every bit of what Tony Adams and a character like that brings to a team, 
Absolutely. That is hugely important because you've got to, you've got to harness that quality in that player that you have, but I don't know that you should spend time necessarily looking for that. Um, but with regards to captaincy, is it possible that, you know, someone like Kieran Tierney could be club captain and we could have a, a sort of Mertesacker, Arteta, Vice, um, captain, captain situation with Odegaard and Tierney that we had, you know, with those two? I think it could happen, yeah. I, I have to say I don't really see Tierney as, as a captain. Um, I see him as quite like... Um, I don't know how to say this without because I, obviously I don't think he's selfish or anything like that. But like I think he motivates himself and he pumps himself up, and and that's fine because he's on the exterior of the team as well. I kind of think your captain should be in the spine of the team. I, I also think like with Tierney, a lot of people mistake his his on pitch extroversion. I don't think he's an extrovert off the pitch. I think probably quite the opposite. Mm. Um, I think people kind of conflate that with leadership and, and I don't think it is, which again, I'm not saying that it means it's like it's a bad thing or anything like that. Albeit, I think there are some lessons Tierney needs to learn about managing his own body and stopping all this kind of trying to be the hero and the big, like, I think he's got a bit of a hero complex, to be honest. And I think it's why he keeps getting himself injured, playing through pain and things like that. Um, for me, I, I think it, it, should and will probably go to one of Ben White or Martin Erdegaard. Um, I don't really mind which. The the thing that attracts me to the idea of making it Erdegaard, the thing is with captaincy, I think it I think it broadly doesn't matter. I think you can get it wrong by giving it to the wrong person, and we have seen that mm-hmm. at Arsenal several times mm-hmm. over the years. Or sometimes you can you can get it right because you give it to the player who then finds another 5%. And I think of Fabregas, for example. He was ready for that when that happened. And I think we got an extra 5% from Fabregas because he knew he was ready. And he was like, oh, shit. Well, not oh, shit, but he was like, yeah, I'm the captain now, so I'm responsible. And that's what kind of would persuade me to go with Erdegaard. Because when I look at Erdegaard, I see probably, with Saka, Arsenal's most talented player, and one of our most consistent players, one of our best players. I think he's superb. I still think there's another 5, 10, 15% in this guy. I really do. And particularly in front of goal. And I've got a feeling that if you give him the captaincy, it's almost like I'm I'm still kind of convinced that at least part of the reason Smith Rowe got into double figures for goals was because he got the number 10. And he thought... <laughs> It, it, it's not the number 10 itself. It's not. It's just a number. It's not magic. But I think it was that idea that, yeah. right, I'm responsible now. I'm one of the big players in this team. I have to, like, and I'm sure the conversation last summer was, we need more goals from you. And he's like, right, okay, I'm not a kid anymore in this team. And I think something similar about Erdegaard, if we gave him the captaincy, it might just mm. get that other 5%. That, uh, okay, when I'm in front of goal, yeah, I've got to have a shot. You know, yeah. I, and just just taking that. So I've just got to fit, like with Ben White, I think if you give it to Ben White, you just get Ben White and that's fine. Uh, that's fine with me. Erdegaard, I've just got a feeling you might get another 5% from him. Mm. Okay, we'll wait and see, obviously, what happens this summer. Lacazette is gone, Aubameyang is gone, and a decision will have to be made. I'm sure that it will be made in a, a timely fashion. We won't get to October. Uh, still waiting to find out who the captain is, and then um, uh, he turns around and tells all to fuck off. Um Let's do a couple of quick ones, although <laughs> this isn't really a very... Um, I suppose we might have to spend a little bit of time on this. Tim, I'll ask you first... Um, San Carico says, Hi chaps, a more general question about sports washing and money slash power in sport. Uh, the, I think it's pronounced LIV or live splinter tour in golf seems to mirror the European Super League con, uh, concept of no competition for loads of money with no authority willing to challenge indeed the uk government lobbied the sale of newcastle to the saudi uh, public investment fund uh, and the power hungry is it just a matter of time before the inevitable happens in european football whether there is an independent english football regulator or not yeah i think so i I think what we've got i mean we're basically getting it by the back door with the changes to the champions league aren't we it's it's a little bit like the super league was the you know the hundred percent of that idea Mm. and actually what we've got with the reformed champions league is like the diluted version 
of it. And it's going to be, I know a lot of people use this analogy, you know, of the frog boiling in the pot. Yeah. Um, so for people that don't know, if you put a frog immediately into boiling water, it will jump out. If you put it in temperate water and you gradually turn the temperature up, it stays. And, and that's kind of, I, I think that's what's kind of happening. I think I, I know nothing about golf, have no interest in it whatsoever. Um, one thing I will say is a massive big up to Rob Harris, though, a brilliant, brilliant journalist who has some balls on him to ask some very tough questions to people in power. And we've seen him do it with Pep Guardiola as well. Yeah. Um, so massive, massive respect to him. Um, but what I, from what I understand, what's different about the golf thing here is, and maybe it's not different actually, but you know, these guys grow up wanting to win certain tournaments and then this tournament just gets made up and it's like, yeah, perhaps it doesn't have the the prestige of, you know, like mm. you didn't grow up wanting to win that you wanted like the masters and things like that. Yeah. And, and actually here's just a bunch of money to play <laughs> yeah. in a tournament we've just made up. So maybe there are parallels. I, I do think it, it is kind of a matter of time. And in the next iteration of the champions league, when again, the big clubs go back to UEFA and again they threaten them with this and again they get some concessions. We'll get games based around the world. We'll get games in New York. Like all of that is going to happen. I think all that's going to happen or all that's happening is there are forces that are making it happen more slowly than some of those clubs would like. Um, but what's what's really interesting, I think, is this battle between old and new money um, at the moment, this battle between like your Man United, Barcelona, Juventus, and then like PSG, Man City. And you look at the big things that have happened this summer and they've already happened. Mbappe turning down Madrid to stay at PSG, Holland going to Manchester City and them happening straight away in the mm. summer. That to me, that's where the tension is between like the new and old money. And actually when you break it down, they've both got points like, for a club like Man City to say, well, how else could a club like Man City or PSG break into this cadre if not for external investment? And then it's, uh, Madrid, etc. they've got a point in saying, well, actually, this isn't healthy. It's, 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 yeah. I think that's the pinch point for me. It is um, interesting, isn't it, Phil? You know, the idea that someone like Mbappe would stay with PSG to, you know, win the French title, you know, the lure of Real Madrid, for most football players, um, you know, particularly continental ones, is is enormous. But of course, you can be tempted and incentivized to stay where you are. And if the reports of his wage are true, it's just it's astonishing. But um, yeah, I mean, what what do you think about this this topic in general and where football is going? And you know, more and more, the Premier League, the financial disparity um, has been exacerbated by COVID and players will go where the money is and, and the Premier League in and of itself could be seen as some sort of small extension of the Super League concept. Yeah, I mean, I think what makes sports washing so effective is any kind of criticism or an attempt at a conversation is instantly batted away by those involved, especially we saw it with the Newcastle fans who were desperate, 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 desperate to get rid of Mike Ashley. So whoever's coming in is going to be seen as the Messiah. And, and you know, I, I don't know how I, I would even react in that situation. I think it's a huge moral difficulty and a huge moral question that would probably take a lot of time for people to consider on their own and, to have a think about it, but even just journalists writing articles or people writing uh, questions or asking questions in press conferences, they were met with kind of such general disdain, um, especially by supporters of those clubs. And it then went into, oh, you've got an agenda and it just kind of dilutes the conversation. So nobody can have an actual conversation about, about the issues at hand. And I think, while everyone's sort of getting the pitchforks out at each other on the ground floor, those at the top level are loving this because nothing actually gets revealed or, or spoken about. Mm. And I think that's what makes sports watching su such a, such an effective tool is, is, is like Tim said with Rob Harris the other day, all he did was ask a simple question um, and he got thrown out of a press conference. And it's like, 
how are we supposed to make or, or put the people at the top responsible or you know they should be they should be well equipped to answer these questions you know it's their it's their project they're the ones backing it with their billions of of you know insert x currency here and there should be an open discussion about it because these issues do matter but sport in general and football in particular is so tribal that we can't have those discussions because as soon as Miguel Delaney writes a column about where Newcastle have got their money from his messages his emails his dms are just flooded with abuse um and you know fair play to these guys for pushing the issue because i i wouldn't have the energy for it i just i just people are so defensive and critical and mean and aggressive and any you know anything that comes to my club it's an agenda or you know we we shouldn't apologize for being happy but people need to realize that it's not about your club it's about the direction of travel um and that's what frustrates me because and we're not innocent arsenal were not innocent you know with the with usmanov involvement and where kronky gets his money from you know it was the same with chelsea abramovich gets sanctioned and what are they singing at norwich away um roman abramovich roman abramovich it's just like it's so it's so tribal and it and it really takes away the ability for any constructive conversation because people just go with their hearts and not with their heads and mm. i think it's a huge issue because the people at the top are lapping this up because things just get swept under the carpet yeah um and my my concern is newcastle are coming <laughs> they're going to come quick and they're going to come fast and it, people don't realize already what's happening there but it, what i'm telling you in a couple of years they're going to be right up there in the top four conversation and it's it's happening right in front of our eyes mm. well look um yeah it is a tricky subject and maybe one that would merit a little more discussion more in-depth discussion perhaps we might do that at some point during the summer but let's do one very quick one to finish and it comes from emil smith row your boat and he says uh, which individual players improvement other than Saka most holds the key to our success next year and improvement could include such things as improved availability by way of reduced injury proneness or a better grasp of the language for example and I'm going to take the host privilege and go first on this one because um it might be it might sound a little strange because I don't think necessarily he would be key to our success but I really feel like if Aaron Ramsdale can have two halves of the season like he had the first half of the season I don't think the drop-off was as bad as some people have said but certainly I think he was better in the first half of the season I think if he can really consolidate himself as the 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 good version of himself if you want to call it that um I think that would be really really important for this team um because it, it impacts the way that we play uh, the way we play out from the back, and certainly if he can keep pulling off saves uh, the way that he did, I think it'll be uh, really important. Tim, I'll let you go. I'll let you go next. Yeah, sure. My one's going to be an availability one, and it's Thomas Party um, because the the one conversation we didn't have about who we should buy this summer is backup for Party, but because I don't think we can really do it, I don't think you can have like I think basically you lose Thomas Partey, you have to change to a double pivot. Yeah. And if we sign Tielemans, for example, we're probably in a better position to do that with like Xhaka and Tielemans. That would feel a bit better. But but Partey being fit for the whole season, um, particularly because of the groove he found in the second half of this season with his place in the system, he really picked it up. He stopped that inconsistency. He was consistent again. And I think it's so, so crucial. And I, it... it a hundred percent cost us a place in the Champions League. His injury, one hundred percent, no doubt in my mind, we're in the Champions League um, if Thomas Partey is is not injured in April. Um, so him being mm. available, please. All right, Phil, what have you got? Yeah, I had when you asked the question, two players came to mind, and I think Tim's nailed one of them, and that was Thomas Partey, and the second one was was Gabriel Martinelli. Actually, I think. We all know what what uh, exciting, dynamic talent we have there, but I would just like to see him add a little bit more consistency to his game because I found I found him quite streaky last year. I mean, he had that incredible spell around December, January time, 
And then he also played well towards the end of the season. But I just think we've got such a unique um, and honestly perfect wide forward for the modern game because of his intensity, his directness, his, you know, head down, I want the quickest route to goal kind of mentality. And I think, you know, which is not unusual for a, a young player that he's still lacking a bit of, of finesse, a bit of consistency in his end product. But I really think he can do it. I think it's all there. We just need that last little bit. And I've got no doubts that he'll be um, he'll be there with Saka and Smith Rowe. I just think it a little bit needs to come together. Um, but in terms of his overall play, I think I saw improvement last year. But for me now, it's just about adding that consistency because I think we've got one hell of a weapon there um, oh. when it all comes together. All right. Yeah, well, it will be great uh, for those improvements uh, to happen. I think um, it is one of the most exciting things about where this team can go is that you know these young guys really can get quite a bit better. So uh, fingers crossed you see that on top of all the uh, the signings we're going to make, the couple of strikers, a couple of wide players, all that kind of crack. Uh, it all lies ahead of us this summer. We better leave it there for now, though. Tim Stillman, thank you very much. My pleasure as always. And Phil Costa, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much indeed to my guests. You can follow Tim on Twitter if you're not doing it already at Stilberto, at Stilberto. And Phil is at underscore Phil Costa, at underscore Phil Costa. So there you go. Another week is over. Maybe this time next week we're sitting here talking about, I don't know, something crazy like signing a new player, maybe two. I'm just guessing. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, but it would be nice because then we'd have new stuff to talk about. And uh, I'm looking forward to a bit of that. So, look, we will leave it there uh, for this week's show. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. If you want to give us a review or a rating on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you use, that will be greatly appreciated as well. James and I will be here on Monday, as always, with an Arsecast Extra. So do join us for that. You can hear a bit more of myself and James, by the way, over on Patreon. We have uh, an episode of Waffle this week, the podcast in which we talk about everything except Arsenal. That's available now, patreon.com forward slash Arsbog. But we will be here on Monday. Have yourselves a great weekend. Until the next one, take it easy. Cheers. Bye-bye. Welcome back to Sky Sports News and today some of the top golfers in the world are defending their decision to join the new Lucifer Tour. Former world number one Ricky Price Pickenstocken was speaking today at a press conference and played down concerns that the tournament is being run and hosted by Satan himself. Look, at the end of the day, we're just here to play golf. Sure, he's done some stuff in the past that is not great, but... Who amongst us hasn't done some stuff they're not proud of? Sure, he sent a lot of people to hell, and he is, of course, the source of all evil in the world, but maybe with our golf and enormous pay packets, we can go some way to rehabilitating that image. While one of England's top golfers, Steve East Forrest, was also put on the spot. Steve, do you feel in any way morally quandrified? by the fact that you are taking money from the devil himself. No, sorry. Sorry, I can't answer that question. Why not? Well, basically, it's because any answer I give is going to make me sound like a right twat anyway, so I might as well just keep my mouth shut. 
Not everyone was completely evasive, though. We did hear from former Arsenal player Andre Arshavin, now turned professional golfer, and he explained why he's getting involved. Oh, oh, the money, man. Have you seen how much money is? It's absolutely crazy. You think I'm stupid? I don't turn this down. <laughs> This is a story that will run and run and we will keep it going here on Sky Sports News when we return more ownership mayhem in the Premier League as another nefarious character comes to English football. We'll have more on Tottenham's takeover by Maroon 5 after this.